reason that Rachel is here is because I'd have no clues how to do this. <laughs> Okay. Okay, you're all good. Go ahead. We're and all set to go. go. Okay, so first of all, an introduction. I am an entomologist. Um, I have been gardening in Thunder Bay since 1981, so it's almost 40 years, and uh, and I've learned an awful lot along the way. And what I'm going to do is, I used to teach uh, insect ecology at the university here, and I also. Uh, taught an environmental biology uh, course. And so in between the two of those, it was really interesting to uh, incorporate the academic with the practical. And so I've been practicing in my garden for years. What I know about uh, the garden, the reason we started gardening, I have a garden with my spouse, Lucy, uh, is because there was no organic food in Thunder Bay. And uh, so we decided to grow our own. Uh, organic because we don't use the industrial inputs that's common in industrial agriculture today. There are no pesticides, that is to say no insecticides, no fungicides, no molesticides. What we have left is what you have on the screen that right now. You can use biological control techniques, you can use cultural techniques, and you can use environmental modification. And with these three main areas, it's possible to uh, grow some pretty good food. So this is a garden. One of the things, this is our garden. Um, it's a few years ago and it's late in the season. One of the things that you can uh, see is that it's a real mishmash of all sorts of things growing uh, in different areas. Uh, we do some companion planting. Uh, these are uh, potatoes in through here and there are fava beans in with the potatoes and so the fava beans are um, uh, a nitrogen fixer and it's sort of you know it, it works both ways and then there are all sorts of flowers as well it's important to have flowers in your garden because they help with a uh, part of the biological control uh, process so what I've decided to do is pick a few uh, insects that we've had experience with here in Thunder Bay. And uh, I've picked these guys because uh, this gives me an opportunity to illustrate the three different uh, principles that I'm using to do the controls. And as you can see, uh, we had some questions in beforehand and it seems like slugs are universal. And so I have a special section on slugs. Now, the good guys that we've got, uh, some of them include uh, parasitic wasps. The flowers in the garden are there because the adult parasites uh, require nectar and pollen for uh, their existence. If you make an absolutely wonderful, pristine monoculture type industrial garden, then you're going to do without parasitic wasps. The other uh, things that I've got here are predaceous ground beetles. They're just general predators. Uh, the ladybird beetle, uh, love it. Um, hoverfly larvae, uh, and the reason I'm including love hoverfly larvae and lace wing larvae is because it's not, it's important to know what the bad guys look like. It's even more important to know what the good guys look like. And I always fear that some of these are going to be targeted by the beginning gardener and you could kill them and they're actually doing really good things for you. And, uh, and then there's this other one down here, which seems a little weird, uh, viral diseases of insects, but then that's part of uh, sort of the, the biological control using uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, say for example, Bt. And then uh, I've also got, um, because it was advertised as a <laughs> plant diseases, I threw in a powdery mildew section as well just to satisfy the, uh, yeah, everybody's need to know about this horrible, nasty um, fungus. Okay, so biological control using aphids. Aphids are really beautiful little creatures. They've got these little uh, twin tail pipes coming off the rear end. And of course, uh, they've got a little sucking mouth part as well. Um, and on their own, they wouldn't be too bad, except that they're little amazing uh, reprodu reproducers. Um, a, uh, an aphid is born, like an, an, an adult aphid, has about three generations of aphids within her um, reproductive system at any time. So that there's an aphid within the aphid 
already set to go with another aphid inside of that. And so they can build up their population incredibly quickly. Um, and so this is a pepper plant and these are aphids on the, uh, the flower bed of the pepper plant. And I'd say this one doesn't have a chance because of the uh, number of aphids. It would be even better if aphids were just wingless insects, but when the food source gets really poor, the aphid then produces um, another generation with wings and then they fly and uh, lo and behold, you have another problem somewhere else. Um, but the worst thing about aphids is that they transmit diseases as well. So if uh, the aphid has been feeding on a uh, diseased plant, the plant's losing its nutritive value, they produce the wing form, the wing form takes the disease and you are in big trouble. But then uh, aphids always bring along uh, are attractive to other organisms. The ladybird beetle, um, as I said, one of my very favorite insects, um, kind of a sexy little thing. And, uh, and the, the great thing about the ladybird beetle is that it's not just the adult that eats it. And, um, and so I'm, I'm showing you this picture of the ladybird beetle eggs because they're laid on the underside of leaves. Uh, sort of note what they look like um, and the color. You don't, uh, a lot of people will go to the garden and then crush everything that they find on the leaves. And uh, you don't want to crush these guys. These are precious. And the larva is most spectacular. Um, it, this is called uh, aposematic coloration. It's really easy to see in the garden. Uh, and the reason for that is because they've been producing some chemicals inside of them that make them really yucky tasting. The adults have the same chemicals and that's why they're so wonderfully brightly colored. Um, so that deters birds and various other predators from eating them. But um, between the adult and the larval form, they, you've got a, an amazing uh, means of vacuuming up aphids off your plants. And this is the pupa, the pupal stage of the uh, ladybird beetle. Uh, it kind of reminds me, when you find them, they kind of look like bird droppings on the plant. So again, uh, you've seen it, um, they're precious, uh, you know, treat them with uh, care. And here we go with a, a ladybird beetle at work. Uh, this is the larva, uh, aphid in jaw, and um, uh, just doing its thing for you. Uh, the second one that I wanted to show you, this is another aphid um, predator. This is a lacewing, a uh, whole different order of insects. Uh, again, very beautiful. It also produces uh, some noxious substances to uh, help uh, deter predation, but it's a, a greeny color and so it kind of blends in with the background. So that's the adult. It eats aphids as well as uh, the larval stage. As a matter of fact, the larval stage is such a voracious predator that the late swing has come up with an amazing adaptation to prevent predation of its eggs, actually cannibalism of its eggs. The first larva out of an, uh, a late swing egg uh, mass would eat all the rest of the eggs and then go on and uh, eat basically anything that comes into contact with. So they lay them on the thre on threads like this. And if you um, do have these wicks in your garden, you will eventually see something like this again on the underside of the leaf because uh, that's where it doesn't get rained on. And this is a lace wing larva at work. Um, it has hollow mandibles. Uh, it injects enzymes into the aphid Think of the aphid as a tetrapack and the, all, uh, the hollow mandibles as a portable straw. And so the, uh, the lace wing larva wastes nothing, just sucks it dry and then goes on to the next critter. Um, here's a hoverfly. And you've, if you have been gardening, then you've seen hoverflies. They just, they're gorgeous insects. Um, this one is uh, colored quite brightly. It's not toxic. It looks like a wasp. Okay, it's like it's got that yellow and black marking on it. And so what it's doing is it's mimicking a, uh, a wasp and it gets some protection from predators that way. And of course, hover means that they do hover in front of the flowers. Again, the importance of having flowers in your garden to feed the adults. But what they do is they lay eggs on the plant 
and the eggs hatch into what looks like a fairly mobile maggot. Um, and uh, the adult will lay its eggs wherever there's an abundant food source, that, let's call it aphids, um, because that's what they like the best. And, uh, and then they just go through and mold them down. So there you've got um, three good predators of aphids. And now uh, this is a parasitic wasp that I've got up here, an aphid wasp. Uh, notice that it seems to have its abdomen poked into the side of the aphid. And that's because it's laying an egg in the aphid. So these are really tiny little wasps. Uh, they live inside the aphid, complete their entire uh, juvenile stage in there, pupate in there, and then come out of a mummified aphid, leaving a big hole in the abdomen. So if you find, these are called mummies. If you find parchment-like aphids in your garden, um, then you are in luck because you now have um, a, uh, a parasitic wasp that uh, will help to control the aphid population. We were successful one year. We were bringing our pepper plants in the house because this is Thunder Bay and who gets their peppers to mature. Um, we're doing okay this year. It's been a phenomenal summer, but uh, we'll still bring them in. And when we bring them in, even though there aren't any aphids on there, we know that there's one at least, and then it just goes crazy through the winter time. And one year we brought them in and we brought in some uh, parasitic wasps as well. And they actually managed to eliminate the aphids on the plants. That was a really spectacular. It's the only year that we have <laughs> ever really had success getting the, uh, the peppers to mature as well. Otherwise, it's just uh, trying to get them to overwinter. Uh, one year it was like, you know, if it were only above to zero now, we could put these outside. The other thing that happens um, with the, a lot of these things is if they're outside, then it's windy and rainy. And that helps to keep the pests away too. So uh, next one. So that was your uh, example of uh, biological control. Lots of biological control. Every one of those was a, uh, uh, an example of biological control. Now it's cabbage looper. Um, cabbage looper and uh, cutworms as well. Uh, so typical uh, damage on a cabbage plant. Uh, the unfortunate thing about the cabbage looper is I really, really, really love the butterflies. They're just amazingly agile, good vision. Um, the antennae are loaded with all sorts of uh, sensory organs so that they can sniff out mustard oils from your cabbages and, uh, and then they lay their eggs. And they lay their eggs on the bottom of plants. But these are different from the uh, ladybird beetle. So, uh, you know, it's possible to Google. Don't believe all of the images in Google. They're often incorrect but you'll get some idea as to what it is that you're looking at. And this is another example of biological control. This is a sack of uh, uh, cabbage looper. It has had uh, polyhedrosis uh, virus. If you find one of these in your garden, they're really yucky and they are unbelievably useful because you can take one of these. Now, think this is a virus, right? We're dealing with COVID, our pandemic. If COVID did this to us, we would have a different attitude about wearing masks in public, I think. Anyway, the, uh, the larva is valuable because you can take it, okay, this is gonna gross up most people, throw it into your blender with a bit of water, blend it up, then take that liquid, pour it into a uh, watering can for the garden, and then water any of your cabbages, uh, water any plants that are affected by any caterpillar, and you have got, you just, uh, you know, I have one frozen in the freezer. Uh, okay, that's pretty gross too. But it's in a vial. Uh, now, cutworms, uh, hideous organism. Uh, they, we had a, a great, cut, great season for cutworms this spring. I uh, went out and found uh, 18 in one morning. Uh, fortunately, there are different ways of looking after them. They're uh, very difficult to control. Uh, there really aren't any heavens to bits insecticides that can be uh, used against them, and that's just as well. Um, so what we do for cutworms is we um, 
we do mechanical, which is a, a, an example of a cultural control. And mechanical, here I'll just uh, move on a bit. This is the typical cut worm damage. So what you've got here is obviously um, probably a leak or you know, probably a leak that has been um, cut down. It's like, why do they have to be so greedy? Like eat a leaf. You don't have to kill the entire plant, but that's what they like to do. So, uh, but the nice thing is that then you go and you say, all right, now I'm going to find the cutworm. And you, you uh, start uh, with your finger. You just loosen the soil around the base of the plant. Um, sometimes, uh, like with fava beans, that they actually really love fava beans. So it's a case of companion planting and trap planting because they're in with the potatoes. I'd rather lose, lose a fava bean than a potato. And they have actually killed potatoes in some cases. But uh, sometimes the plant will be able to recover. Um, but you can go down with your finger in a circle around the stem of the plant and expand that uh, search. And uh, I have a little mantra, be patient, be patient, be patient. And you just keep doing that. And uh, nine times out of 10, you're able to find the cutworm. And then you can do whatever you want with it after that, whether it's drawing and quartering or burning at the stake uh, or soapy water or just straight out crushing between your fingers. It's up to you, but they are uh, much hated in our family. Um, and this is the inconspicuous moth, which lays the eggs uh, that produces the cutworm. Uh, one of the things that um, sites keep telling me is, you know, clean up your garden, get rid of all of your debris. Um, well, we mulch our garden and we put leaf litter on it in the autumn and the soil is wonderful and rich. And it's like, you have to decide which way you want to go. Is this organic gardening or is this industrial gardening? Um, you know, the, the growing season is only so long and uh, a lot of these pests, which could be really serious in other parts of the world, aren't all that bad here. Uh, this is another uh, form of cultural control. This is called a cutworm collar. Uh, obviously, this is not going to be good for seeds that you put in the ground, but if you've got a precious tomato plant uh, and you want it to survive, you can uh, transplant it into the ground, put the collar around it. Uh, I'm not sure what this one is made out of. We do ours out of uh, one liter milk cartons uh, and cut them into three or four collars and then just push that down around the plant. And at the end of the year, you just take out uh, the uh, milk carton is plasticized. So there will be pieces of plastic, like, uh, like plastic, plastic wrap. Um, just take it out of the garden and then that um, goes to the, uh, the landfill. Okay, so cutworm collars, that's the only thing I can uh, recommend there. Most of the things that I'm going to say today, I've tried. Uh, this I've not tried, I just saw this the other day and I thought the cutworm has to curl around the base of the plant. And so uh, I'll try a few of these. The sticking the nail in beside the plant uh, looks super awesome and it would be a wonderful way to thwart the cutworm. But the problem is it'll just move on to some other plant. <laughs> so, you know, uh, maybe it's better to have that trap crop of fava beans uh, that I put in with the potatoes. Now, another uh, cultural modification uh, that we use is for the carrot rust fly. Um, the adult there, a maggot on a carrot and some really excellent uh, damage on carrots here. Uh, you may think that, I mean, this is a small maggot, um, doesn't do a, a terrible amount of actual physical damage to the carrot, but you can't store them because each one of these is open for rot. Um, but in a carrot like this one here, where there seems to be just maybe one or two uh, scars, uh, one year we set up our cultural control technique and trapped the adult flies in with the carrots. Very bad mistake. We hadn't rotated sufficiently. That is to say we hadn't moved our crop around in the garden. And so we wound up with carrots look, look very much like this. And so to try to salvage them, I would, I, I cut the carrots uh, into pieces, removed the, um, the damaged parts, 
set them in the draining rack for the dishes and let them dry and then we put them in bags and label them one, two, or three, depending on how severely bad they were. And much to our shock, uh, a carrot, as long as you don't disturb the outer skin on the carrot, if you just cut it and get rid of the disease part, the carrot will heal itself and they were still edible a couple of months later, uh, but we were keeping them in a refrigerator in a plastic bag, perforated plastic bag. Um, this is our, uh, our way of avoiding uh, the carrot rust fly. We put reme or floating row cover over wire cages and uh, we use that to exclude the fly. We're just simply creating a physical barrier to keep the fly from uh, getting to the plant. And, uh, and then when you're successful in doing this, you do wind up with a, a pretty good harvest of carrots. And if you have had a child and you have a wading pool, they are amazingly useful for doing um, washing up your vegetables at the end of the season. Uh, now, on to slugs. And this is going to be an example of uh, environmental modification. Slugs evidently like mushrooms. I've never seen a slug eating a mushroom like this, but it's just it's so spectacular. I mean, it's, it's just got it going up the stem. Uh, slug damage, and uh, this has happened to us as well, where you go out and your cabbage or your uh, lettuce in this case was, was nice. And then uh, I've always wondered if slugs are edible, but I've never investigated it because sometimes it's sort of, uh, we actually tried um, bok choy cabbage and we could follow the slime trails from where they started in the row and they eliminated everything in the row uh, that year. And what we learned from there was our neighbor had his compost bin right next to the bok choy cabbage. And the slugs love compost. They like the fermenting uh, vegetation and it's a perfect habitat for them, nice and moist, lay their eggs. Uh, this was a compost bin that was retired, retired after this season. And I just said, well, uh, obviously, if they love the compost so much, I'm just not going to create the perfect habitat for slugs. And so I moved my compost bin and uh, the slug problem moved away. So if you have anything that provides ideal habitat for the slugs, try to modify it and uh, make it less, um, less attractive for the slugs and you can eliminate some of your slug problems that way. Um, you can use um, citrus traps. We've tried this and it's been of limited success. This one is particularly stupid because there's no pulp in it. And they're not just going in there for a uh, sunshade, like they would prefer to have some food in there as well. Um, probably better if it's fermenting too. Uh, and the other one, and this is of course the traditional fermented uh, slug trap. Um, I've tried it, uh, but it was the container that I tried was a saucer. And what they did was they lined up around the edge of the saucer, like the, the whole saucer was filled with slugs on the outside of the beer, and they were drinking. <laughs> it's like I created, well, I mean, if, if slugs got COVID, it would have been a good place when they catch it, but you know. Anyway, uh, but I like this, I like this design. I'm going to try this one. So, so far, uh, I've learned two things in this talk. I'm going to fool around with the nails and I'm going to, uh, to do something about the slugs in the garden. And it may have been the beer that I was using, I don't know, but they, you know, they've never drowned themselves in it. They've always been really, you know, they've got those wonderful little feet and they just cling on. And this is new for, uh, for me for this year, the striped cucumber beetle. Um, and I only just spawned it in the garden three days ago. Uh, and what I'm doing for this one is, uh, I found it because it was like party time in one of the squash blossoms. So a cucumber beetle eats all of the cucurbits, uh, including cantaloupe, and honeydew, um, the um, squash, uh, zucchini, uh, and cucumbers, of course. Uh, but they really are attracted to the flowers and so, I thought I will take advantage of this uh, party time. And as an entomologist, I'm familiar with this structure. You can Google it um, and it'll give you the information as to how you can create one. It's an aspirator, also known as a pooter. Um, 
And uh, it's really handy because you take the, uh, this is the tube end, you put the tube in your mouth and you go, and there's, you have to have a little screen over that because you could just go, and there's the bug down your lung. So that's not good. But this, uh, this tube can be much longer. And so you can get, you can actually sneak it into the flower. The cucumber beetles are incredibly active. I've never seen a beetle fly as easily as this one. And uh, they will, um, you get the tube in there and you start sucking and uh, it's just chaos, it's wonderful. And then you take the whole thing, you throw it in your freezer and that's the end of the beetles and you can go out and do it again. And I'm hoping that I might be able to take care of the population in my yard, but I think uh, we now have an established population in Thunder Bay. And this could be another one of those. Wow, uh, I forgot to mention the other way we do slugs is we hand pick at night. And what a waste of time. It just seems like, you know, their life could be easier doing other things. And I don't need any more insect pests. And because the spiked cucumber beetle has arrived this year, it makes me think, well, now Thunder Bay, uh, since I've started gardening here, we didn't have the carrot rust fly, now we do. Uh, we didn't have the European uh, gooseberry uh, um, saw fly, and now we do. We didn't have the striped cucumber beetle, and now we do. And we didn't have ticks in Thunder Bay. Ticks first appeared here around 2000, and now we do. And it's sort of, oh, what, what can climate change do for you? Uh, you can grow all sorts of wonderful plants, or you can also expect that the uh, the wonderful plants that you're growing are going to wind up with some pretty horrendous consequences because their uh, predators are, 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 well, plant predators, that's the herbivores, are going to be uh, following as well. So uh, this is a squash at one of our gardens. We have multiple gardens. And this plant, this leaf down here is showing the very first signs of powdery mildew. Um, what happens, oh, and I just want to mention because I'm doing really well with my time. Uh, the squash plants, this is growing in a compost bin. So what we do is at the uh, end of the planting period, we'll completely fill a compost bin, put uh, soil and uh, old compost on top of it, um, put in the amendments that we want, the uh, um, you know, uh, bone meal or whatever, wood ash, and, uh, and then plant something, well, actually it's always squash. I really like squash. And we plant the squash on the top and, uh, and it just, it goes crazy. And the other thing I should say is, you don't have to let it uh, run this long. Uh, it, the, the squash that are developing out here will never uh, reach maturity. So it's better to start pinching your squash um, probably the middle of August, okay? So just pinch off the growing tip and that'll give you enough squash production on a vine that you'll be able to uh, get some uh, reasonably uh, sized squash. And this is an example of powdery mildew. Uh, this is a common name that I really love powdery mildew because that is exactly what it looks like. Um, initially, uh, what we do is at the first sign of powdery mildew, um, I'll, I'll rip off the leaf. And um, you know when you see that your squash plant has that many leaves on it, uh, it's not going to make much of a difference. One of the things that uh, I've learned uh, academically and it seems to work in the garden, is that a plant can easily withstand 30 to 50% defoliation and still be productive. Okay, so if you have a hole in the leaf, it's not a big deal, don't sweat it. But if you uh, have lost all of the leaves on the plant, you're in trouble. So you have to reach that compromise. Um, oops, sorry. And so with the powdery mildew, rip off the leaves, keep ripping off the leaves, um, as it progresses. One of the problems with powdery mildew is that it occurs here late in the summer and what has happened is we run into very 
uh, cool, well, not very cool weather, but it's cooling off and it's high humidity and it's perfect for the mildew. And, uh, and so there's really nothing you can do about it. And here is another um, uh, recipe that I just learned about and they evidently powdery mildew is intolerant of baking soda. I'm interested, I'll be running that experiment this year. So you mix up um, baking soda and water. You can look up the recipe for yourself online um, and uh, spray that on your plant. And it wasn't made clear if you're supposed to do this like continually or whatever. So as I said, a big experiment for me for this year. And that's it, I'm at the end. So what we've had is uh, examples of the biological control, cultural uh, modification and environmental um, techniques. Uh, so keep those in mind and deal with all insects in an appropriate fashion. Awesome. Okay, so Thank you. she said I had 30 minutes. <laughs> I'm always a little, I love to talk. This is great. This is perfect. I'm just assuming everyone can hear me off to the side. Um, did you say baking soda or baking powder? Sorry. Oh, baking powder. Thank you. No, soda. baking soda, bicarbonate of soda. Bicarbonate of soda. Yeah. Anyway, you're going to Google this. Yeah. Gotcha. You know, powdery mildew. Okay. So great, <laughs> folks. If you have questions, please go ahead and add them to the chat box. And if you need to learn how to access that, move your mouse around and you'll see it at the bottom of your screen usually. And meanwhile, while I'm waiting for new questions to come in, yeah. I have some questions that were sent in a little bit earlier mm -hmm. and I'll go through uh, and try to uh, uh, answer those appropriately. Um, one question was about diatomaceous earth, which is, um, which is considered to be a uh, biological or a, uh, an organic, uh, acceptable for organic growing. And di di diatomaceous earth is just um, uh, little silica tests is what they're called of diatoms of ancient uh, organisms. Uh, now it's supposed to be completely harmless. I want to point out that it is silica and these are fragments. This is like glass, do not breathe the stuff. It's very, very bad for your lungs, mm -hmm. okay? So when you're using diatomaceous earth, you have to apply it uh, after every rain and that'll help uh, with some problems. It's certainly, insects are easily abraded. Uh, they're amazing creatures because they're covered in a little waxy coat that keeps the water in. If you can break that waxy coat, they desiccate and they die. Mm -hmm. So if you are having success with diatomaceous earth, every time it rains out, you have to uh, apply it again. Uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a bacterial disease of uh, many Lepidoptera. Um, again, it's sort of like that polyhedrosis virus. Uh, if you uh, have had some success, then you win, okay? That's it. Uh, you don't have to keep putting it on. It's just if there are any larvae left that are un, uh, uninfected, then go ahead and treat for them. Uh, question about earwigs. Uh, we have occasionally had earwigs in our garden. Uh, you can use the traps, the trap technique um, for earwigs. They're, they're, they demonstrate a behavior called thigmotaxy. They love to get into little tight places and be sort of totally surrounded and having things touch on them all, on all sides. And so the idea of the, um, there, I've never tried this, but there's a rolled up newspaper, dampened rolled up newspaper, and they'll crawl in there and then, I don't know, I guess after that you can just burn it or do whatever you do with your damp newspapers. But um, that would be one way of dealing with them. Um, they are absolutely amazing insects. They're really good mothers. They look after the little babies, and but they can eat just about everything in your garden. So if the other thing is, you know, what I said about the defoliation, um, some of these insect pests in small numbers, um, don't sweat it. It's like, you know, just uh, learn to live with it. Give them a little bit. It's only when they get 
to be super numerous and you have your crop uh, dying, that you really have a problem. Flea beetles. I've never had an abundance of flea beetles. We've always had little pinholes of the leaves, um, but they have never done enough damage to warrant me getting particularly concerned about them. Besides, I love the way they jump around when you disturb them. And, you know, and now that would be another beetle that would be real, a real challenge to use an aspirator on. Um, one of the uh, suggestions, and remember, this is not something I've tried, was white sticky traps. Um, they specify white for flea beetles. I don't know why, because most insects are attracted to yellow. Um, when we set up our row cover over our carrots, we put in a couple of yellow uh, uh, sour cream lids and uh, coat that uh, with the uh, tangle foot. And, and then we're able to see if there are any flies in there. Uh, one of the other um, suggestions for flea beetles was two parts ethanol, five parts water, um, that would be as in cups, and then one tablespoon of liquid soap so that you've got good coverage that way. You could also use the floating row cover technique as for the carrot to try to keep them off whatever it is that they're eating. Um, Another suggestion was diatomaceous earth. It's sort of like, this is the shotgun approach. It's absolutely everything that I know that can be used against any insect has been used against these flea beetles. But then I, I've, uh, I just learned that there is a new bacteria out there called Bovaria bassiana, which is specific for beetles. So it works like the Sinisternichensis. And then good old neem oil, which is, you know, one of those uh, magical substances can also uh, be used somehow or other. Somebody had a question about their lettuce uh, having holes in it. And I would suggest slugs as a first guess because they, you know, you saw some, some pretty severe slug damage in one of those images, but um, slugs would be a good, uh, good guess. And somebody else asked about leaf miner. Um, we grow spinach, we have leaf miner. Um, and what we do is when we harvest our spinach or if we see uh, minor damage in the garden, we just pinch it off and that's it. Uh, the minor is over. It has to be, it would have to be really severe um, to, uh, to warrant anything more than that. Um, and we have just never had it be really severe. And then someone asked about their bug bean, uh, which was yellowing. And I can only guess that it has a disease. Um, it could also be nutrients, but if it's growing in the place where it was uh, happy the year before, the nutrients should be okay, especially if you put on compost. Um, it could also have root maggot, but then it wouldn't be just yellow. It would eventually, during a hot day, uh, it would wilt and, and it would be all over. It would be dead. So those were some of the questions that I had for warm-up. Yeah, we've had four other questions come in. Okay. Any suggestions for the Colorado potato beetle? Oh, I was hoping to avoid this one. <laughs> no. Uh, no. <laughs> the shortest answer you've ever given. Kevin. Yeah, no, 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 I'm, I know, but I will. Um, we now can use some of the other techniques that I've been talking about. Uh, check the plants for eggs. If you can get the eggs, like there's a cluster of uh, 20 or 30 uh, little um, larvae in there, potential beetle or uh, potato manglers. So uh, look at the underside of the leaves and crush the eggs before they start, because you don't want to spend the rest of your summer picking the larvae off the plant. Um, the adults fly, and you don't, uh, so uh, that doesn't work. Uh, I mean, you can't prevent the adults from getting to the plants, because by the time they're laying their eggs, the plants are already big enough that you can't have a floating row cover over them anymore. And I don't think potatoes would like to have a floating row cover over them anyway. So uh, the horrible answer is picking. And, and here's something to consider, and I have no idea why, because we have potato beetles in Thunder Bay. Um, and I'm just looking around for a piece of wood here. And we have never ever had potato beetles in our garden. <laughs> okay, and we've had gardens in four 
different locations. And uh, maybe there's a potato beetle deity that is protecting us. But uh, yeah, so no personal experience with potato beetles. And I really hope it stays that way. Oh, sorry. There was once we planted potatoes in a garden in the country that somebody um, uh, had offered because I was doing a radio program and, and was looking for some place to grow some more veg. Uh, and they had potato beetles and didn't tell us about it. So we came back to skeletons. Mm. So yeah, no crop there, but there we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, this question probably is pretty short. Is there a way to get a hold of you, Ken, to talk about Fragmites, Fragmites afterwards? Sure. Uh, email? We can... Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, you can share yeah. my email with the participants, but not on YouTube. <laughs> yes, that's fine. That sounds good. Um, Amanda, for certain, we will get that to you and we'll discuss with Ken uh, how to send that to participants. Um, so, next question Something is eating my kale. I found small green caterpillars on it. That's called a cabbage looper. But I know we also have slugs. How can I tell damage from the two apart? Oh, you can't really tell them uh, apart. But now that you've found the small green caterpillar, uh, they do start off small and they will get large. And so uh, best bet would be to do the uh, hand picking as a pain, but it's a possibility. You could, uh, if you want to invest the money in Bacillus thuringiensis, it's a, a well-tried and uh, trusted uh, bacterial disease of Lepidoptera. And then that turns them into the little bags of, of slime that I showed you. Um, and as I said, like, okay, if you are lucky enough to find one of those, you know, don't, don't waste it. Um, freeze it and keep it and then you you are um, you're investing in your biological control uh, arsenal and for for upcoming years and uh, and that would be a really you can share it with your friends what the heck you know yeah I've got a bag of slime <laughs> Um, also, just so you know, Matt, who had asked the potato beetle yep. question, says thank you. Okay. I'll let you know what works, if anything. Okay. So, Matt, thanks for getting back to us. Um, okay, so a question from Laura about ants. Yes. We have a lot of ants in our garden, right. and they seem to be all over the stems of the tomatoes. I'm assuming they're feeding on something, but we can't see any aphids. We do have cutworms. Are the ants damaging the plants? And we can't seem to get rid of the ants no matter what we do. Ooh. Well, first of all, I would, uh, in the past, until a few years ago, um, I would have said, oh, ants in the garden, that's not a big problem. But uh, we have learned that um, when we were uh, planting cucumbers under black plastic, the black plastic was to heat up the soil and get things moving along, um, the germination was really terrible. And then uh, Lucy, who is the cucumber woman, uh, would say, oh my God, look, look at this, there's one coming up. And then the next day it's gone. And we learned that the ants were actually eating the seedlings. So it's not good to have ants in your garden. Um, if you can locate the nest, um, and my very first love of an insect was ants, so I say this with great sorrow, uh, you can try to modify the habitat and that would be by continually wetting the nest. They will not like that. And so they will move. And hopefully they will move somewhere away from your garden and you've solved the problem. I could also um, suggest that you could use um, some sort of ant bait, but I have not um, uh, said anything about baits because I really don't trust them. Um, even if they say that it's, you know, an inert compound, uh, there's usually uh, something that is uh, affected by it. For example, and I just realized that there was one question that was asked that I didn't um, answer, and it was the use of sluggle, which is a bait for slugs, <clears throat> which is 
supposedly uh, innocuous and uh, it is in danger of surpass. And one of the articles that I read said that it may, may not be dangerous for pests, but it kills earthworms. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, baiting for um, uh, insects uh, comes with risks. Unless, of course, it's sort of like, you know, uh, and I've not been successful with this one, but there are these, you know, ideas that you could uh, make them or allow them to eat bran and then they explode. And I can't imagine an insect being that stupid, but uh, it's always a possibility. Awesome, thank you. Um, so Martha does say thank you for the difference for her kale. Oh, I can read this. I'm correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so going, we're go, on the tomato plant. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. And so going back to the tomatoes. Um, the ants aren't going to be eating the tomatoes. There must be something else up there, or the tomatoes may be producing um, substances, uh, fluids to attract other insects. Sometimes plants have nectaries on them, like peonies will have uh, a little, um, little, a little um, droplet of clear liquid on the flower head, and then there will be ants all over the flower, and people go crazy and get ant poison, and it's like the the peony wants to have, it's trying to attract insects, so there. So there may be something on the uh, tomato that uh, is attractive to the ants, but when the tomato is that big, it's not going to be, uh, it, it's not going to be affected by the ants. So, uh, and ants are general predators as well. And uh, speaking of general predators, yellow jacket wasps and bald-faced hornets are also general predators, and I have seen them uh, examining foliage on our gooseberry and taking some of the gooseberry soft line. So not enough though. We always, yeah, gooseberry we've given up on. <laughs> we have just totally given up. It is, it's like hopeless. Yeah, I could crush all the eggs in the world and that's still not enough. Now on to the next one. Um, so this one is about the, sorry, my computer told me funny, so I lost the question. Okay. So is the tomato plant leaf curl virus found in our area? I don't know that uh, the answer to that. Okay. It probably is. Has something going wrong with the tomato plant? Might be it. So maybe. Yeah. Okay. If you do have a diseased plant, get rid of it. Uh, mm. That's one. Of, and don't get rid of it into your compost mm. bin. Get rid of it because um, Lucy, uh, as our as the tomato woman as well, <laughs> we have specialties. I do potatoes. She does tomatoes. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, Anytime she uh, trims anything off her tomatoes, she gets a wilting disease from the bottom. Maybe this is what it is. From the bottom, leaves start to uh, yellow and, mm -hmm. and dry up and she pulls them off and then puts them in the compost bin in our front yard. In our front yard, it's like a forest in the city. And so there are no tomatoes in there. Uh, the compost can go into that area. And so it's not that it's sent to the landfill, it's just sent to a different habitat. Okay. Yeah, so thank yous. And then the lilac question. Okay. Had the tip of her lilac brown and curl when she unfurls it, there's a little black dirt like but bits, I'm sure. Any idea what it, it sounds like it's uh, caterpillar frass. That's the, the scientific name for insect poop. <laughs> uh, frass. And uh, so a lot of them will. Uh, when they're feeding on a leaf or in a plant, they'll use the silk that um, all caterpillars produce to uh, tie things up and make a nice a safe little um, shelter for them. And then they can pupate and be somewhat out of uh, vision. And um, when I say somewhat out of vision, uh, we've got um, a wonderful uh, situation in our backyard where we've got a, a balcony that's basically at treetop uh, level or mid tree level. And so we can sit there and watch the chickadees and the vireos and the warblers working the tree. And how any insect manages to survive is a mystery because these guys are so amazing. And yet they'll work the tree and then come back and work the tree and then they'll leave and they'll come back and they just keep getting things. And so there's a reason for birds migrating to the great white north in the summertime because we have such an abundance of biomass from all of these insects. Okay. Um, Matt has a yeah, question about introducing predators. Okay. Okay. Now they. <laughs> yeah, I love that one. I I think this is the the big ripoff for uh, 
uh, or um, biological control. Because of course, when you have a predator that's mobile, it'll just move. So uh, there was one case where people in California were collecting uh, ladybird beetles in their overwintering sites where they would be super concentrated mm -hmm. and, uh, and then selling them. And the first thing the beetles want to do is disperse. And so you have a concentration of ladybird beetles in your yard for a day and then they move to your neighbors who could always say thank you, but probably wouldn't share in the cost. And the praying mantis can't survive in Thunder Bay, not yet. Uh, uh, the winter temperatures are still too uh, low, so uh, they would die. Uh, the, you can, of course, release them, but they're, again, general predators. Um, and so they will, uh, they eat each other, as of course everybody knows about, you know, the life of a male mantis is a, uh, one short one, and that's it. And I don't expect you to know this, but Matt is joining us from Sault Ste. Marie. Do okay. Think a praying mantis would survive there? In the Sioux, it would be marginal habitat. They've got oak trees that survive there and mm -hmm. maples. So, okay. yeah. So, yeah, you might have. But again, uh, it's sort of, there was a, uh, I did my PhD on dragonflies and there's a really, in the 1800s, there was research on dragonflies versus mosquitoes. Well, uh, guess what? There are many, as many dragonflies out there as there possibly can be because dragonflies eat each other as well. And they don't just eat mosquitoes. So it's sort of like, okay, well, you know, you can make a buck doing the research and then move on to do something else. There you go. Um, we have a question that came in from Taylor. Yes. Any suggestions for flowering plants to attract beneficial insects? Oh, like what would be a really good flowering plant? Yeah. Um, something that is, um, well, if it can flower all season, that'd be wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're, um, if, if you're interested in just pollinators, then uh, there is a, a whole range, like, you know, if you look at the sequen sequential flowering of plants, it usually starts off with uh, pussy willows and dandelions during the springtime. And those are uh, super important for honeybees and for all of the other um, nectar feeding insects. And then after that, uh, you go through a, a wide range of plants, which usually will flower for one or two weeks. And I'm trying to think of something that just basically flowers all summer long and I'm at a bit of a loss, but that would certainly be, you know, an ideal plant to, uh, to think about. Um, there are special ad adapted flowers for say um, honeybees or, or not honeybees, but bumblebee flowers. And, uh, but that's the, the, uh, the flower head is, uh, has evolved so that it will admit the bee and do a maximum amount of, of pollen release and, and then a reward with some nectar. Um, so I would say, uh, you know, if you actually bought a, uh, a package of wildflower seed mix, that would probably be your best uh, and most likely way of having flowers throughout the season and you provide um, the essential services to attract the pollinators and also, as I said, providing uh, nectar for the parasitic wasps as well. Great, more thank yous, wonderful. We have a couple of minutes left if anyone else has a burning question. Yeah, two minutes, ten. I'd have to uh, be quiet for two minutes and that would be <laughs> I had a question from a friend who put into 10. She okay. said, do I really have to squish them? No. Oh, actually, uh, Lucy squishes nothing. She's a, you know, pacifist kind of person. She drowns them. <laughs> uh, water and a little bit of dish soap. And just carry a jar around with you. Or if you're really gross, you can do sort of collect for a week. And they all die and then they ferment. And then you throw it in the compost. And it's all good for the compost as well. Okay. Yeah. We have one more. Does zest really work to keep out the deer? That's not an insect question. <laughs> yeah, but zest. I I don't know. I, I really don't know. I've not heard of that one. So uh, try it. 
Let us know. Uh, actually, we did have a garden uh, that uh, eventually became so much like a forest in the city that it got deer. And so we abandoned that garden and we were happy for it. <laughs> so yeah, the zest keep out there. I would say I, I did see a really interesting, speaking of this garden with the deer, I saw an interesting innovation that a neighbor put in on a new garden. And they didn't put up the big wire fence. They put up uh, uh, two by twos and then they stapled the plastic uh, mesh onto them. And uh, I think they are hoping that just the presence of that thin barrier is going to be enough to keep the deer out of the garden. But I'll keep you posted. All right, fantastic. Well, that was wonderful. That brings us to four o'clock. Thank you everyone for attending. We really appreciate your participation, your questions, your creativity. Ken, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Sharing all of your knowledge with us. Uh, if you have follow-up questions, my email is in the chat and it's also the email uh, in the message you got with the link to this webinar. And if you wanted to re-watch anything again, the recording will be mailed out to everyone who registered, um, usually within a few days. So you can expect that in your email account soon. Bye guys. Bye, thanks. We'll see y'all later, maybe <laughs> next time. <laughs> you told them they couldn't show us the fake faces. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's one up here, somebody called Rachel something or I other. Know. <laughs> you know, it's a bearded thing, <laughs> moving his lips at me. <laughs> <laughs>